Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, we appreciate your, your coming and turning up. Um, and uh, I want to especially extend a welcome to those who traveled long distances in the last 24 hours to get here. I wanted especially to, to uh, welcome Aaron Swoboda, who flew all night from uh, Minneapolis to get here. But unfortunately, he's got a fever, and he's in his hotel room at the very moment. And he may not be able to make it at all. But he did fly all the way from Minnesota to get here for this morning's session. Um, anyways, let me turn it over to Pete Eicholtz, and uh, we'll get started. All right, thanks, uh, John. We have, uh, had, like, like we said yesterday, this conference has uh, uh, two legs, a research leg and a policy leg. Yesterday was the policy leg, today is the research leg. We heard a lot of, lot of facts yesterday, and this is going to be even more fact-dense than, uh, than, than was yesterday, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, the conference, uh, as it is, stimulates, uh, tries to stimulate research uh, on the cutting edge between engineering and economics, and uh, also aims to help set an agenda there. And if you look at the program, uh, that's exactly what the program uh, is designed to do. We have three paper sessions with two papers each, and we have one panel session, and especially this panel session aims to set a research agenda uh, uh, and this research agenda is an agenda where, where engineers should meet economists. So um, now for these, um, uh, for these panel sessions, uh, there, like I said, there, uh, for, for the paper session, there are three paper sessions, one about uh, codes and economic performance, one about residential, and one about financing and investment issues, because was, Rory, we heard yesterday uh, uh, one of the barriers to, uh, to, uh, to a green to a green real estate world is financing, so we should think about that too. Now, the, uh, in terms of housekeeping, the, uh, for the paper sessions, the idea is that everybody uh, presents 20 minutes and that the, the chairpersons are uh, incredibly severe when people go over 20 minutes and there's special punishments and stuff like that that we have uh, talked over with the chairperson, so, so speakers watch out. And then we got uh, 15 minutes for the discussant or discussants. So if there's two discussants, then we really give them 15 minutes. If there's just one discussant, then maybe it's good to be a bit modest and not go over 10. And that means we, we got 10 to 15 minutes left for general discussion with the audience. And uh, uh, you know, yesterday we had a lot of that, and I hope we're going to have a lot of that today too. Now, uh, I'll stop and I'll give the uh, floor to Richard Gilbert. And Richard is, uh, is, is pulling a very special trick. And I think we can learn a lot from that in the Netherlands too. Some, something else that comes out of this beautiful cooperation that we have. Because in the Netherlands, if you're a professor, you have to retire at 65. By the time I'm 65, you have to retire at 67. But it's not allowed to stay. You cannot stay on and just you know, go on until you die. The beautiful thing here is that you can on, on, go on until you die. Because Richard is, at the same time, Emeritus Professor of Economics <laughs> and Chair of the Berkeley Competition <laughs> Policy Center. Now, that's a very special trick, and we all want to know how you do that, um, Richard, so please. Yes, Pete, you can have it all. You just have to talk to me, and we'll talk about how you can have it all. Uh, so this is the session you've all been waiting for, whether you know it or not, uh, because this is the session uh, that is going to talk about how building codes really function and what they really do for you and how well they have worked. And we have... Uh, Two really great papers, uh, I, I think they're, they're really state-of-the-art papers, uh, that look at the issue of building code performance in different ways. One top-down, one another one more bottom-up. And interestingly, they reach conclu conclusions that uh, are quite consistent with each other, which uh, uh, I think is interesting in its own right. Uh, so. Uh, you've heard uh, our speakers now are going to be uh, Max Alfheimer from UC Berkeley, uh, and uh, then we're also going to hear from uh, Matt Conchin from uh, Yale University, and the, the logistics is they're going to talk, uh, and then we'll have our discussions. Uh, you've heard the session codes uh, for, for this session. If you violate the codes, uh, the consequences are very severe. And then we'll open an, uh, up uh, for some discussion after uh, we hear from the discussants uh, from the session. So let's start with Max uh, from our very own UC Berkeley at the Ag Econ School, and he'll talk about the impact 
of state level business uh, building codes on residential electricity consumption. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, thanks for inviting us to give this paper at this great conference. For those of us uh, interested in building codes, there is no better conference around. So uh, this is really fabulous. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is, is work that I've done with uh, Alan Sandstead at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, whose name unfortunately fell off the, the printed copy of the paper. So, so that will be fixed shortly, full co-author. That was just a, a typo there. And my graduate student, Anin, whose last name I will uh, refrain from attempting to, to pronounce. <laughs> Uh, so uh, what, what we did, we started about two years ago wondering about what could potentially explain this famous Rosenfeld effect. If I want to click forward, I use this, this thing. Oh, I got it. Okay. So there are, there's this picture that, that we see all the time that I'll show you in a second that per capita electricity consumption in California has been flat since the mid-1970s, and many argue that some part of that is due to, to policy. Well, I think there's a couple of other interesting pictures that we never get to see. So if you look at national per capita consumption of total energy, uh, that's also been flat since 1970. So this is all sources of fuel. If you break this down for a little chuckle here by blue states versus red states, the states that voted for Obama versus the states that, that didn't, you see that the trends are roughly the same, although consumption in, in, in red states is, is clearly higher than in blue states, which has partially to do with that fact that weather in these red states is, is more challenging than in the blue states. Uh, if you look at just the residential sector, again, the dashed line here is the national average. That has also been flat. So not just electricity, but total energy has been roughly flat since 1970 with a slight upward trend in red states, which is offset by the more populous uh, slight downward trend in, in blue states. Now, if we look at uh, this, this picture of per capita just electricity consumption, so taking out oil and natural gas and these, these other sources of, of energy here, we see that there's slight growth in the national average per capita consumption here with a faster growth in, in red states than in, than in blue states. And again, the level difference is roughly the same. But the thing that I found really surprising here is that in the 1970s, there was this break in trend that we essentially went roughly from a 5% growth rate per year to, in California, a 0.4% growth rate per year in per capita uh, electricity consumption, which is the green solid line right here. California, of course, is, as all of us know since yesterday, has been at the forefront of energy efficiency policies. And, and we, we generally tend to think that uh, part of this break is due to these policies. Well, there are some states that don't have as stringent policies who also experience these uh, leveling off things. I'm thinking of Idaho and, and Montana, for example. So the question that I want to motivate this, this paper with, and something that econometricians haven't really spent a lot of time focusing on, is trying to make some headway. I'm not going to attempt to explain everything here, but trying to make some headway at explaining what part of this, this change in, in, in trend here may be due to policy. So policies are thought to matter. And, and I would be amiss if I, I wouldn't talk a little bit about how we get at these numbers. And I'll spend a few minutes on that. So this is a picture that, that my co-author Alan Sandstead showed yesterday. In California, we spend quite a lot of time, uh, especially at the California Energy Commission, trying to figure out what the counterfactual electricity demand or energy demand would have been in the absence of policies. So we use these bottom-up models, and I will tell you what those are uh, in more detail in a second, but basically engineering-based model to figure out what electricity demand would have been in the absence of these policies, then figure out what installed capital is uh, in, in the face of these policies and basically take the difference uh, between the two and that's attributed to, to savings. So if you look at, at total consumption for California's four largest, uh, well, actually here we have all five. So five large utilities in, in California. It's a fairly significant share due to other energy efficiency program and the red slice here is building code. So building codes are thought to be a, a really big deal here. Now, how do these, where do these numbers come from? 
right? As a suspicious econometrician, that's my number one question always to figure out whether I can get a paper out of maybe coming up with a different or hopefully better number. So where these numbers come from, to, in order not to just figure out how effective uh, building codes were, but how effective energy efficiency policies in general were at reducing energy consumption, or today we're interested in, in CO2 emissions, these bottom-up engineering economics models that first appeared in the 1970s and have just multiplied quite rapidly essentially take uh, an installed capital stock in the absence of policy, I'm repeating myself, but just to make sure we are 100% clear, in the absence of policy, calculate energy consumption under this uh, status quo uh, capital stock, replace it with what pro policy prescribes, calculate energy consumption then, and take the difference to be attributed to policy. So the most prolific example of a study of this type is this recent McKinsey study that, that Art Rosenfeld had, had up here yesterday. There's some quibbles. It's not exactly the same, but it's in the, in the same flavor here. Now, the thing that surprises any economist, and I've had the same sort of discussion four times within the past 24 hours here, is negative costs bother us greatly. Right? So if I see negative costs, how could a neoclassically rational individual not pick up that, and they weren't $20 bills lying on the ground yesterday. If you looked at that picture, they were $250 bills lying on the ground. And, and I, I would personally pick those up. So the question here is, how come that people aren't picking up these $250 bills lying on the ground? And the, the flip side of that question is, are there really $250 lying on the ground? Or is there something that we're not taking into account here that turns that $250 bill into actually a costly exercise where it may cost me a bunch of money to actually pick up that, that $250 bill? So this is this whole literature on the energy efficiency gap, which Catherine summarized uh, very nicely yesterday. Now, these potential studies, so these bottom-up engineering studies, Maybe they're overly optimistic. Maybe these, these negative costs here are simply a sort of a rosy picture that much like how economists often criticize the physical science community, just completely ignore behavior. Right? So maybe individuals respond to, to policies in ways that negate or offset some of the impacts of these possible um, Policies. So you could think of the fact that, uh, as a recent new homeowner, putting some <coughs> CFL secretly into your living room, and the other person living you within the uh, in the house walks into the living room, notices that the light is a slightly different shade of green, and all of a sudden says, "This is not the same service. Uh, take out these CFLs and put back incandescent light bulbs." So maybe even though there is a policy prescribing CFLs, individuals go ahead and take their their storage of of incandescent and replace them with these, uh, with these non-policy uh, conforming technologies. So users may act in ways that offset these policies. The other issue is, of course, enforcement. John Quigley threatened all of us with lack of turkey if we wouldn't uh, hand in our, our paper on time. Of course, he failed to recognize that several of us are vegetarians. So, so that, was, that, that was not a good way of, 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 of threatening or trying to enforce this deadline. But fortunately, we're at the same university. I'm sure you'll sit on one of my review committees at some point. So I had other incentives to actually get the paper in on time. But the point here is uh, there are varying degrees of enforcement of these, of these policies, whether they are building codes, applying standards, or whatever it is. So depending on how well you enforce the, the policy, that may have something to do with how big the, the impacts are. Now, economists panic when they hear standards. So two people walked up to me this morning and say, I, I, I don't hear the word tax enough at this workshop, right? So how dare you uh, keep on talking about these standards when we teach all of our undergraduates that uh, codes are maybe not the least cost way of, of achieving a policy. So abstracting from that, I'm not going to judge whether a code is better than a tax or a cap and trade or whatever your favorite policy mechanism is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that uh, policymakers pass these building codes, which they do and they will continue to do. And I'm going to ask, are they effective at reaching their stated goals? And do 
the way, uh, do the savings that we get out of these papers conform with what these bottom-up studies, studies find? So I'm not going to make an argument for or against building codes. I just want to know if they work as, as advertised. So we're not the first ones to have tried to, uh, to analyze these, these energy efficiency policies. There are a few national scale studies. They, again, in, in face of recent policies, seem to multiply like, like wildfire. Uh, the most popular one right now is this Gillingham. Uh, Karen Palmer and Richard Newell, I think, are the other co-authors on that, that looked across the literature, added up all the different savings from different types of energy efficiency programs, and arrive at a roughly overall 5% reduction in national primary energy consumption in the year 2000 due to the cumulative effects of all policies and programs, local, state, and federal. So 5%. Uh, nationally, which is a pretty big number. There are a couple of studies out of ACEEE and ASE. Uh, most of these are either survey studies of these bottom-up studies or are bottom-up studies themselves. On the econometric side, there's a nice paper by Jaffe and Stevens in 1995 in GEME. But other than that, uh, there aren't that many studies out there on these, these policies. Lucas actually has a, has a paper which I should have mentioned here, but I, I Apologize. So you're you're. Oh yeah, that's right. You're in there. So, so the the nice thing about this is those of us complaining that econometricians haven't paid enough attention to this this literature. Apparently, we do, since everybody on the program today has an econometrically based uh, paper that looks at exactly uh, this issue. So so the literature is filling in rapidly with high quality work. So, a very simple question. Uh, no fancy modeling going on here at all. All I'm trying to answer here is how effective were state-level building codes, so not federal building codes, which we're about to get, but state-level building codes at reducing residential electricity consumption. So I'm just going to look at the residential sector, and I'm just going to look at building codes. I'm going to ignore all the other energy efficiency uh, programs that are out there. So we've talked a lot about building codes, so I'll just give you a one-minute summary of where they come from. In the winter of 1972-1973, I was not alive yet, but it apparently was a very cold winter uh, that led to electricity shortages in the, in the Midwest. Schools were closed, government offices were closed, and people uh, cried out for, for regulation. So the National Institute of Standards, what NBS is called today, uh, was, was asked to develop a set of standards that states could adopt. So essentially guideline standards where state could adopt a set of building codes that they could then implement in their uh, local urban areas or rural areas. So there were these ASHRAE building standards, uh, which later turned into these uh, model energy code building standards, which today uh, the most common sort of set of energy codes that, that states use are these IECC codes. Some states have slightly different versions of these codes. There's some heterogeneity in, in the stringency and what types of prescriptions are within these specific codes. Uh, California's Title 24 standards of 1978, we think of the most stringent ones in that end, and other states have, have less stringent ones. So the point to take away from this uh, rather quick slide here is there's quite a, a significant degree of heterogeneity in what types of building codes individual states adopted, both on how stringent they are, but also at, uh, in how uh, well they are enforced. So. If you want to learn about building codes, what do you do? I had no idea, so I went onto the, the great internet and, and looked, and it turns out that the uh, US Department of Energy has a great website uh, which has information on both residential and commercial building codes uh, for each individual state. So you can go on there, you can look at what type of state, uh, what type of building code they've adopted, uh, when they've adopted it, whether it's mandatory or not, and how it compares in stringency to certain standard types of, of building code guidelines. So what we did and by we, I mean my very talented graduate student, Anin, spent lots and lots of time on the internet looking at this website, uh, another website on building codes, and basically going to individual state agencies' websites to learn about their residential building codes to figure out when those states actually first adopted uh, mandatory building codes, and we recorded that date. We tried to be really diligent about that there was an actual code adopted and passed and put in place on the ground there 
but as with everything, there may be some measurement error in our, in our right-hand side variable here. So we essentially have, and, and this slide is not intended for your reading consumption, which explains the eight-point font here, but what you have is you have 48 states uh, in, the, in the rows, and across the uh, columns you have years from 1974 until today. If there's a green line that tells me from what date on did that particular state have a residential building code. So the takeaway message from this slide here is there's heterogeneity in what states adopted building codes. There are still six states today that do not have a residential building code. And there's also heterogeneity in when these states actually adopted residential building code. So I have time series and cross-sectional variation in the adoption of a policy that I'm going to exploit in order to get a, an estimate of how good these building codes are at reducing uh, energy use. Now, again, I would be amiss uh, to over advertise, uh, it would be wrong to over advertise the beauty of this experiment, right? You always want to think about what the correct counterfactual is. In, a, in, in, in the perfect setting here, you would like to have a randomly assigned building code across states. Uh, where states are, are roughly identical across all other dimensions, and then much like in a public health type study, extract the effect from treated versus control uh, groups due to random assignment. This is anything but random assignment here. Uh, you adopt a residential building code uh, based on maybe whether you have a greener median voter, Matthew Kahn would probably argue, or uh, maybe because um, it seems cost effective to do in your particular uh, state. Who knows what the story is here? This is not random assignment, so we should look at this analysis, and we'll try and deal with this in the econometrics a little bit, but this is not the, the, the perfect sort of randomized experiment here. So one thing you could do uh, is you could just do something really simple here. Without any fancy econometrics, basically look at the date at which an individual state adopted a residential building code. Look at the trend in electricity, residential per capita electricity consumption in the two years prior to the adoption of the code. And then look at the consumption per, per capita to, terms for the two, three years after the adoption of the code. So this is what finance folks call an, an, an event graph where you basically have year T is the year that a given state adopted an, a residential uh, building code. Uh, take the weighted average across all states, and what you get here is you see this upward trend in, in residential electricity consumption, and then you see a break in trend uh, right after the adoption. So this would lead you to believe without making any sort of fancy uh, controls for other possible confounders here that there maybe is something here that shows me that there's a break in residential per capita electricity consumption around the uh, time of adoption of a residential building code. Now, the way I looked at that in that, in that previous picture is very much a zero, one type comparison. The policy's on versus the policy's off. It's not like everybody who has a building code all of a sudden lives in a, in a building that corresponds to the specifications laid out in the building code uh, documents. The only people who actually have buildings that correspond to the building code, in theory, are people who move into new buildings or people who uh, reconstruct or, or have additions to their buildings. So the key here is you should see bigger effects in state that have, states that have adopted this, this building code and that have lots of new construction. So what we've done is uh, we went through a bunch of dusty census documents and assembled a panel of building permits, which is a proxy for building starts, so not a perfect measure, but it's some proxy for uh, how many new buildings there are. And what you see on this picture here is you see a number between 0 and 1. It tells me the share of buildings construct, uh, permitted since 1970 that were built under a residential building code. Now that measure is going to be our policy measure, which tells me in some sense the intensity of treatments, meaning what share of buildings built since 1970 are actually built uh, conforming to these new building codes. So if you adopt early and you build lots of uh, new buildings, such as in Oregon, for example, you see this early takeoff with a high penetration rate here. If you're late to the game, like Pennsylvania, you see that in 2003 they adopted a building code and you see a relatively low penetration of buildings that conform to the building code. Econometrics. Uh, I'm going to go five minutes over because I know this is a... a, 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 a 
the big bounce. I know. Okay. So, so <laughs> quickly, uh, the econometric model. So what we're essentially going to do is we're going to regress state level per capita uh, residential electricity consumption on average electricity price in the residential sector in that year on the price of a substitute, which is substitute fuel, which is natural gas, on income, on uh, heating and cooling degree days, which are a, a measure of, of weather, how much uh, air conditioning and heating you would do, and our policy measure, which is the share of new construction since 1970 permitted under a building code. So that variable ranges from zero to one. That'll be our first regression. Then we're going to augment that regression by a measure that clearly addresses one point that, that I pointed out earlier, is we have to worry about how stringent building codes are and how well they are enforced. So there's heterogeneity in state level building codes. Not, built, not every state's building code is the same as, as the next. So what we have is we have a measure of building code stringency and how well it's enforced. So ACEEE has an index which goes from zero to eight which tells me how jointly, how well enforced and how stringent the building code is. So we normalize that index from zero to one and we add that as an additional regressor here in a, in a separate regression which then tells me whether states with better enforced, more stringent building codes actually have lower levels of per capita electricity consumption. Then we control for uh, state and year fixed effects. We're also going to control for time trends and we're going to control for some other policies in here to make sure that our estimates of policy aren't confounded with other things we would, we would worry about. So to make a long story short, I took an even more horrendous looking table and made it into something that maybe you wouldn't laugh at. But the thing I want you to, to worry about, the, the coefficient of interest right here is this building code construction share. So what this building code construction share variable tells me, it ranges from zero to one, is the percent decrease, because the coefficient estimate is negative, in per capita electricity consumption in percentage term, because the dependent variable is a log, if I have 100% of my buildings built under a building code. So if all of your buildings conform to a building code, uh, I have about a 5% decrease in per capita electricity consumption. That finding is robust to introducing polynomial uh, time trends, which are separately introduced for states that have building codes and states that don't have building codes. It's robust to controlling for other policies. So we, for example, include a couple of states introduced their own appliance standards prior to the 1987 uh, federal appliance standard. So we control for that, both with a dummy and differential trends. And this uh, coefficient remains robust. We also, as we've discussed in the paper extensively here, worry about the endogeneity of these average price variables here. So we instrument for average price with lags of average prices, which is imperfect, but what people do in this literature. And again, it doesn't change the coefficients very much. And in this last column here, we instrument for our policy by using lagged weather and using lags of the, the treatment variable here. And again, the coefficient doesn't bounce around very much. So if you have 100% penetration of buildings under a building code, roughly a 5.6% uh, effect if you believe this regression right here. What this last column tells me is I include this intensity variable here. So if you have the most stringent, well-enforced building codes, like in California, your per capita household uh, energy consumption is going to be roughly 5% lower than that of un uh, states that don't enforce any building codes. In addition to that, you add this coefficient multiplied times the share of new buildings constructed under a building code. So since I knew that nobody was going to understand what I said in that sentence, I made a picture. Uh, so what I did here is for two of the regressions, one that allows for this intensity measure and one that doesn't allow for this intensity measure, by state, I plotted with the confidence intervals, the 95% confidence intervals, what these treatment effects actually mean. So for Oregon, if you don't worry about this intensity measure, you get about a 5% uh, impact of building codes. And the standard errors are fairly large, but they don't include zero. So if you keep on going across here, no matter what state you look at, for none of these uh, states uh, do we see uh, 
standard errors that are significantly uh, positive right here. So one caveat here. These white intensity measures right here, I would be very careful about. Because if you are a state that has better enforced, more stringent building codes, it's also likely that you have a state that does lots of other stuff that makes your uh, houses more energy efficient. So this coefficient here may be confounded uh, by the effect of other policies. So if you ask me, and I'm done with my 25 minutes, if you ask me which where the true variable lies, it's likely somewhere between these two bars right here. So finally, what's the takeaway message? Yes, it matters on how big the per capita impact is. But since we're worrying about aggregate emissions and aggregate electricity consumption, where the new construction is in total uh, really matters. So California and Florida are the two states with lots of new construction. And going forward, I'm not going to ask you to read all that. Uh, building codes are significant. The Waxman-Markey bill asks that by 2014, uh, new buildings meet a 50% reduction uh, relative to the current IECC building codes, and then tighten up this reduction by 5% every three years until 2030. So we're about to see federally mandated building codes, both with carrots and sticks, that are going to be much, much more stringent than anything we've seen so far. So I apologize for going over. Okay, uh, our next speaker is uh, Matthew Kachin from Yale University, and he's going to talk about our building codes effective at saving energy. Thanks. <laughs> First, let me apologize for my voice. I, I sound a lot worse than I feel. Um, except under harsh questioning, in which case I may have to give the podium over to my co-author, Grant Jacobson, who's sitting back here in the um, orange tie. Uh, and <clears throat> thanks, everybody, for inviting us to get, present this work. It's great to come here and present it, in part because the idea for this um, started while visiting at the UC Energy Institute last, last year here. Um, so the title of our presentation, again, is um, Are Building Codes Effective at Saving Energy? Evidence from Residential Billing Data in Florida. And in some ways, this is a nice compliment to the paper that you just heard um, from Max, whereas his was very much focused on a macro scale using aggregate data. Ours is going to be very much at um, using micro data at the residence level in particular. And so to start, um, you know, now that, now that uh, Max has, has preceded us, there's the, the question of you know, some of this motivation is, is familiar. But what, what is clear from Max's presentation is that many states, in fact, the vast majority of them, have uh, energy building codes in place. The only thing that we would add to his history of how this came about was this um, coalescing event, which was the oil embargo in 1973, that actually sort of prompted a lot of these states to be more concerned with um, energy efficiency, which was mostly promoted at the time due to resource scarcity and national security concerns. But now more recently, we're in a, a world where there's heightened concern about energy again, but it's also related to concerns about climate change. And naturally, this has shifted more and more focus or attention to buildings because, as you can see from these statistics, in terms of how much buildings account for for um, electricity consumption, energy use, and CO2 emissions, and how these numbers are actually calculated, and there's the potential for lots of double counting. I'm not sure how much confidence I would place in any of these numbers in particular, but the point is, is that buildings account for a large fraction of our energy consumption and CO2 emissions. And then we just saw some of the particular provisions in the Waxman-Markey bill in the House, which has passed, to sort of promote or pass um, energy codes, building energy codes at a federal scale. Um, and then also the boxer carry in the Senate, which has yet to pass, doesn't make quite as specific recommendations, but there are also provisions for building energy codes as there, there as well. So do building energy codes actually work at saving energy? Well. As Max also mentioned before, most of the evidence has come from uh, simulation modeling. And while the simulation modeling is immensely valuable, from an economist perspective or people who focus on behavioral responses, there are some, some sort of at least limitations or some things missing from the analysis. 
One is whether or not they're actually enforced or whether or not there's compliance in them. Just because a simulation model predicts, say, a 4% savings in energy doesn't necessarily mean that'll happen if people don't install the insulation in the buildings when they're constructed. There could also be so-called rebound effects. If buildings become more efficient, the services that they provide actually become less expensive in terms of the expenditure that needs to be made on the energy service, and maybe people will change their behavior and actually buy more energy intensive appliances as a result. Then there are also questions of model calibration. These are susceptible, the econometric models are susceptible to this as much as engineering models. But when we started in on this research, we thought, well, we're going to have, we have an interesting data set and have an interesting question. And we thought for sure that this study, this type of research had been conducted before. And we've been sort of sheepishly saying that we think that there's been no microeconometric study that has, um, has looked at whether or not um, building codes actually save energy using residential billing data. And I'm still going to put a little asterisk next to that when we say it, because I feel like there has to be an example out there. But it still hasn't come to us. We've been asking everybody so far. So we think that this is one of the first um, studies. At least it will be until um, the Khan and Costa paper gets presented this afternoon. <laughs> um, so the primary objectives of our research here are to basically um, use residential billing data to conduct an ex post analysis of whether or not a specific energy code change in the state of Florida affected energy consumption. And to jump right to our results here, what we're going to try to convince you of here is that based on this code, there was um, a 4% decrease in electricity consumption in residential households and a 6% decrease in natural gas consumption. And then we're also going to do some back of the envelope calculations of costs and benefits as a result of this energy code change and translate this into the so-called payback period. And we actually find a very large range for the potential payback period from a private perspective. This is per residence. The payback period ranges between seven and a half years to 35 years. And a social payback period ranges between four years to 27 years. And the difference between those two are the social costs of air pollution emissions and the cost of CO2 emissions as well. And more on that to come in a bit. So the policy setting that we're studying, so Florida, much like many of the uh, other states, has basically a performance-based ener energy code where there's not specific provisions actually required that particular households follow, but it's an overall portfolio of energy efficiency. So there's essentially a, a baseline home that you have an energy budget, and residences have to com conform to their energy budget. And so they can trade off different, different uh, features in terms of compliance. And in addition to the policies for ener statewide energy codes, this is also how some of the certification programs that we heard about yesterday are structured as well. And the goal of the 2001 changes to Florida's residential energy code was to bring the state in alliance with the International Energy Conservation Code. And we're going to focus in particular on the northern climate region. And the northern climate region had um, two, two changes in particular that were substantial. One was that the baseline air distribution system was changed from leak-free to leaky. So if you had a leak-free system, you actually got a credit. And so this actually, the first, the first point there was actually a relaxed the code, made it less stringent. But the big change that was thought to have the most bite was a change in the uh, solar heat gain coefficient of windows. And this was reduced from 0.61 to 0.4. And this was considered to be quite a substantial change in the major change in the north throughout the state, and in particular, the, the major change in the northern part of the state. So engineering simulations, which come from energy gauge, actually predicted that, this, that these changes in the northern region would result in a 4% savings or reduction in energy consumption for space heating and cooling and also for water heating. So in a sense, you could think of what we're doing as a econometric analysis to compare to see how this simulation model actually does in terms of explaining what, in fact, really happened to the households. So we uh, obtained our data from the city of Gainesville, Florida, which is in the northern climate region. And what we got was uh, electric utility uh, billing data, monthly data, on both electricity and natural gas. And the sample was selected for households that had a full 12 months of billing in the year 2006. And the way that we came across this data was through a website, uh, GainesvilleGreen.com which is one of these new uh, websites w that tries to focus in on the effect of, tries to tap into pure effects in terms of energy consumption. So the idea behind this website is you could log in, look at your house, and see how your energy consumption compares uh, to your neighbors. And maybe that would promote more energy conservation. 
Well, that raises some interesting research questions that this website could be used for, but it hasn't been operating long enough for us to study that question. But what they also did is they did a lot of legwork and combined the electric utility data for these and natural gas data to observable characteristics of residences based on assessor, on assessor data. And so I'll talk more about what some of those variables are, but the key one that enables us to study the effect of the energy code is that there's an effective year built. So we can actually basically place each residence of whether or not it was built in the prior to the energy code change or after the energy code change. And because we're interested in matching like houses as close as we can, we restrict the data to looking at just, built, just residences that were built three years before the energy code and three years after the energy code. And there's actually a gray area in the middle there of one year where you can't actually tell because of the lag between the building permits and when construction might have happened, where we can't determine whether or not they're pre-code or post-code change. So we actually remove the one year in the middle and just look at three years before and three years after. And our utility data <coughs> is just for the after years, the 2004 through 2006. And this we obviously do because for the you don't have, the, for the earlier years, the, the postcode change residences were not constructed yet. And then for, for reasons that I'll explain in a few minutes here, we also collected data, monthly weather data, to do part of our analysis. Here are some basic summary statistics. This is basically just to give you an idea of what the variables are that we have. We've got our electricity consumption, so this is about 1,000. 150 uh, kilowatt hours per month. So this is the monthly billing data. We've got natural gas and therms. We have effective year built, which I just described. We have the square footage of the residences. We have the number of bathrooms, number of bedrooms, whether or not they had central air conditioning, a shingled roof. The vast majority of houses have both of those two. And then some of the, the, mean, the mean data for our average cooling degree days, heating degree days, and humidity, which is an important variable in Florida. And so our complete data set is 64,471 observations. And then just to quickly compare the residences, this is a table that compares um, the observable characteristics of those that were built before the code and after the code. So if you also look, we have 1, 000, about 1,300 residences that were built before the code change and about 950 residences that were built after the code change. So they're pretty similar across most of these characteristics. The only one that actually differs is it turns out that in the after the code change, the residences actually got smaller by about 95 uh, square feet. That's significantly different. And, uh, and um, there's also some statistical differences in terms of the number of uh, houses that had, or the proportion of houses that had central air conditioning and a shingled roof. But the magnitude is pretty much inconsequential since the vast majority of them have both of those. So our empirical strategies, there's, there's two that we're just going to briefly describe here and then go, go through the results. The first is basically just to do a comparison between the pre- and post-code change residences. And what we want to do is control for all these observable characteristics that we can and look at differences in the annual overall consumption of electricity and natural gas. But you might think, since the energy code is focused on heating and cooling, that there may be important differences by month and not just overall. So we'll look at differences between the before and after residences also by month. We're thinking that electricity, which is the main uh, energy source for air conditioning, you might expect would have a larger effect in the summer months if the energy code was actually having an impact, um, energy code change, and natural gas, which is uh, used for heating in the winter months. And then <laughs> we'll also do, in a sense, a robustness check where we're going to look at how these houses respond to changes in weather. So not the first approach looks at just average differences. The second one says, well, controlling for average differences, how do these different before, these before and after residences respond to changes in weather? So you can almost think of this in a way as a natural experiment where we shock them with different weather and we see how they if they respond differently to, um, to weather. And here again, you would expect as a robustness check for the first one, that the effects would actually be most significant when there's greater demand for heating and cooling, so the summer and winter months as well for natural gas and electricity. So these are basic uh, results for the, the first. And for many of you, this table will make a lot of sense quickly. For some of you who are less familiar with econometric uh, models, it may make a little bit less sense. But the basic idea here is to show what we have uh, controlled for. So the top row in yellow is, are the coefficients of primary interest, but we're controlling for the household's um, size, its square footage, its air conditioning, whether or not it's a shingled roof. We control for the number of bathrooms, number of bedrooms, stories. 
We also have <coughs> zip code dummies and we have year month dummies. And the difference between um, the, whoops, difference between um, these two columns is we have a time trend that's unique for all the, all the data. And then we also let the time trend differ by zip code as well. So these models you could just think of as, as robustness or different specifications getting at the, uh, the same thing. And the coefficient of interest here is this, these two here, which are both statistically significant and negative at about 48 kilowatt hours per month. And what this says is the households built after the energy code change on average consume 48, about 48 kilowatt hours per month less, which translates into a 4% decrease in electricity consumption. The same exact analysis was done for natural gas, and here that the effect that we find is 1.5 therms per month, which is a 6.4% decrease in uh, natural, natural gas consumption. Now this is overall for, for um, annual, but I mentioned that we might think that these effects would differ by month, and so what we do is actually decompose or relax this specification and estimate the effect different for um, each month. And instead of actually showing all these coefficients, this is just a, a graph. So on the horizontal axis here, we've got each um, month of the year. And the vertical axis is the percentage difference between the postcode change residences and the pre-code change residences. And this is for electricity. And you can see that during the winter months, there's very little difference between the pre- and postcode change residences. But for all these summer months, the postcode change residences consume significantly less electricity. And the estimates range by between about 8% and down to about, you know, between 8 and 4%. So across all these different months, there seems to be a pretty clear pattern of reduced electricity consumption. And then if we do the same thing for natural gas, the pattern is almost exactly reversed, where in the summer months, where natural gas, if you use for cooking or um, hot water heating, may be pretty constant, but natural gas consumption is very different between the postcode resi residences in the winter months, where the decrease is quite substantial, and um, actually even close to 18% or even 20% is the decrease in natural gas consumption here. So a key assumption to this analysis, when we're just looking at the average differences between pre- and postcode uh, change residences, is that there's not some unobserved trend going on. Maybe these places were just becoming more efficient over time for reasons unrelated to the code, and we're attributing it to the energy code change. So one of the ways that we go about exploring that is we use our conditional on our model. We actually calculate the average differences amongst the effective year built for the different residences. So what we've got here on the horizontal axis is the effective year built. So this is 1999 through 2001. This is our pre-code residences. 2003 through 2005 are our postcode change residences. And this, for the econometric analysis I just showed, is the um, we didn't include these residences because we couldn't tell if they were pre or postcode. But in this analysis, we could actually include them because we're just looking for an overall time trend. And what you can see in terms of electricity consumption is the effective year built, the average, actually is not statistically different for any of them. And there doesn't appear over this period to be uh, any observable downward trend. In fact, you could just see how the after code change resonances tend to be lower than the pre code change resonances, if anything. With natural gas, again, none of the differences are statistically different from each other. But there does actually appear to be a sort of downward trend that tends to be there for the consumption of uh, natural gas. So to deal with this, um, <coughs> this key assumption of whether or not there's some unobservable trend in terms of the overall average consumption of these different residences, that's why we also move to our next analysis, which is where we look at their responsiveness to weather. And the real advantage of looking at their responsiveness <laughs> to weather, although we can't actually estimate overall changes, we can look for differences between the houses in terms of how they respond to changes in weather and the advantage is that we can control for average differences amongst the households. And so for those of you who are familiar with um, econometric modeling, what we can do is a fixed effects model. So we can control for all of the time invariant, unobserved uh, heterogeneity in the, um, between the, the residences. And this is the, the specifications that we, that we have here. So the key feature, again, is that we have a fixed effect or the average effect for all households that we're controlling for differences. And then we have our two different time trends, the same way that we ju I just mentioned in the previous analysis. And we look at how the houses respond to changes in uh, fluctuations from month to month and their average cooling degree days and heating degree days. 
And then we see how this responsiveness differs from those that were constructed in the after code change period. And then to track our previous results, what you would expect is that with more cooling degree days, you would have expected that the post code change houses, if they're more efficient in terms of their um, air, condi air conditioning, would increase their electricity consumption by less. And that is, in fact, what we find. And in parallel, but in sort of, yeah, in parallel, with a natural gas, you would expect that the postcode change houses would respond less to an increase in heating degree days um, in terms of how much natural gas they use. And this is exactly, exactly uh, what we find. So the advantage here is that we are able to control for this um, unobserved uh, time invariant heterogeneity. So these are our, our estimates or our overall results. And we, we're, we um, hope that you're convinced, as we are, that this is evidence that this energy code change is actually having um, an impact. And then let me uh, go through some of our very rough calculations in terms of the payback period of what's going on here. So let's think about the private perspective of the households. So one of the things we do to calculate the cost is we assume, <coughs> although this is a performance-based code, as, as I mentioned before, we, to do just back of the envelope calculations, we assume that what households had to do in order to comply with the new code was actually get the, um, the more, um, the low emissivity or low E windows in order to comply. So in some sense, this may be a slight overestimate of the cost because households may have done other adjustments in order to comply with the code rather than adjusting to the windows. But there's evidence that this, um, getting these windows that com comply with this new regulation costs between 10 or 15% more. And if we look at the average price of windows and the average characteristics of households in Florida, this would be about a, between a 650 to about a $1,000 increase in the construction costs of households. The benefits, the private benefits, would actually be a decrease in um, utility bills. And here we have a range between $29 and $89 uh, per year. And the difference here is between these two is whether or not the electricity savings actually occur during on-peak or off-peak times, of which there's um, substantially different prices in uh, that Gainesville Regional Utilities actually charges. So if we do the extreme case of assuming um, zero discounting, and we take the best case scenario, what we find is the payback period for this is about 7.5 years for a residence, and the worst case is actually up to 35 years. So it's a rather large range. From a social perspective, though, we would want to count, think about the, um, the externalities associated with generating the electricity. And so what we do here is a standard benefits transfer approach in economics, where we actually come up with estimates for the marginal emissions of generating this power, the marginal damages of generating this power in terms of uh, health benefits or CO2 benefits, also we do. And we come up with a high and low estimates for these based on numbers that are provided in the literature and using um, emissions databases from the EPA. And from a social perspective now, we see that this payback period ranges between 4 to 23 years. This is including um, all of the uh, emission benefits. But an argument could be made that if you're interested in doing a cost-benefit analysis for the state of Florida, maybe you actually shouldn't care about, about or account for the social costs of CO2 emissions because those benefits are actually accrue outside of the boundaries of your state. So we're not going to we're going to be agnostic about whether or not you'd want to include those or not, but just see how it actually changes changes the um, the payback period increases but to four to twenty seven years. So to wrap up here with some of our main conclusions, what we find is empirical evidence, which to our knowledge is the first actually field. Um, data, microdata, empirical evidence of the effect of an energy code. And we do find evidence of a 4% decrease in electricity consumption, about a 6% decrease in natural gas consumption. And then to compare this, to get back to the engineering simulation model, of which there is a lot of evidence, that 4% um, savings that I mentioned at the beginning that the engineering simulation model did, that was just in terms of energy demand for heating and cooling and water heating. But it turns out that that's only about 50% of a household's overall energy demand. So to compare with our estimates, you actually would have to um, cut that in half. So the engineering model predicts, a, based on what you would expect from utility data, a 2% savings. So we actually estimate um, effects that are larger, larger than, than the 2%. And there's a couple reasons why they actually may be larger. One is that there may be regional spillovers. It turns out that the energy code changes in the other regions in Florida, the changes were actually more significant. And there's some evidence based on energy efficiency programs that when builders actually 
practice one thing in one region, they spill over and they practice them in other areas as well. So there actually may have been some overcompliance in the northern uh, climate region. Looking at some of the trade publications, there also seemed to be quite a bit of confusion amongst builders about what the energy code actually required. Although it's performance based, many people actually, many builders thought that these changes to the windows were actually required. And so it took a little while for them to realize that maybe they didn't actually have to specifically comply with that particular um, change to the, the baseline home. There's also the case that there is um, new appliance efficiency standards that took effect in 2001. And there's estimates that for refrigerators that this would have resulted in a 1% um, electricity savings. So our, if you took this number and you wanted to adjust our savings of 4% for electricity, that would actually be reduced to 3% if you accounted for the savings that might have happened because of the um, appliance. And then this is just a repeat of the private and social payback periods that we calculated. Then the final slide are some general sort of thoughts about the generalizability of these results. Now, the reason why we uh, studied um, Gainesville, Florida, is because we actually happened upon this data set. So it was just a fortuitous, uh, fortuitous um, reason why we studied this area. But we'll try to now make some arguments why it's actually probably a decent place to look at the effects of energy codes. And the first is that Florida, as a state, is known for having relatively recently relatively um, stringent enforcement of energy codes. And part of that is because of the risk of hurricane damage of buildings. So they actually enforce the, uh, or the building codes generally. Are, there's high enforcement there. So if you want to know the potential for energy codes, it may be a reasonable place because you don't have to deal with the enforcement issue as much as you may in some other states. It also turns out that, according to the Energy Information Administration, 22% of all the residences in the United States are actually in the same climate region as Gainesville. So thinking about how energy codes may affect uh, Gainesville, Florida, may be an indicator for so many other places uh, in the country as well. But it is the case that more research is definitely needed to understand um, ener how energy codes may impact in other climate regions because the not only are the construction practices different and the climate is different, but also the mix of energy is quite different as well. And so what we, why we've been kind of surprised that many more of these studies actually haven't been done, what we're hoping is that this study will also provide a template for how other studies can actually do be carried out in other regions where is all that's needed is utility-based data that's merged with some observable characteristics of um, residences. And we look forward to seeing some of those studies and actually doing them ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Now our first discussant is going to be uh, Meredith Fowley, uh, our, our very own Meredith from uh, UC Berkeley here, the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics. Great, thank you. Um, and I really appreciated being asked to uh, review both of these papers and be part of the conference. Um, I really like both the papers. I don't know much about building codes, and um, so it was. I learned a lot from reading the papers. Uh, so both Max and Matt did excellent jobs of presenting their papers, so I'm not going to go over uh, in great detail what they did. Um, and they both also did a good job of motivating the question. So both of these papers ask, sort of address the same question in different ways. Have residential um, building codes and standards reduce household energy consumption, and if so, by how much? And both papers also um, start by pointing out that there are potential limitations with the more standard approaches to addressing these questions, and that is engineering simulation studies. Uh, these are definitely important studies, especially if you're trying to anticipate the effects ex ante. Um, however, they're only as good as the models and assumptions that underlie those studies. And so some of the concerns that have been raised is that these st studies leave out or um, don't fully account for things like imperfect compliance, imperfect installation of these measures, behavioral responses like rebound effects, et cetera. Um, and so we might be concerned that uh, these, the estimates obtained with by using these studies um, are biased or maybe will overestimate the effects um, of building codes. Of course, the econometrics, so the, the, both papers also make a strong case for the value added of econometric studies, but we also have to remember that econometric studies are also as, only as good as the models and assumptions underlying them. So part of my job as a discussant is to look a little um, more closely at some of the assumptions underlying these studies and the construction of, of the counterfactual, because really as both um, Max and Matt very um, effectively conveyed, their real challenge here is constructing a credit 
credible counterfactual, right? What is the, the patterns of consumption we would have observed at these, ha at these buildings or households subject to the building code had that in the parallel universe where the code was not introduced? So that's what I'm going to be thinking about um, today. So um, I wanted to start with Matt's paper and then move on to Max's paper. Um, he did a really good job explaining what he did. Um, but just to be clear, the treated group here, the households that um, were subject to the code, um, were those homes in Gainesville, Florida, built between 2003 and 2005. And then to come up with our best guess of what their energy consumption would have looked like had we not had that um, code change in Florida, they're going to econometrically adjust observed energy consumption at um, homes built just before that code change took place, between 1999 and 2001. They have terrific data. Matt said, you know, we, this is a template, and we hope to see people use similar data, um, re re reproduce that study. Catherine and I are trying to get data like yours. I was, I'm going to go for a pun, green with envy, uh, when I read your study because your, your data is terrific and it is hard to get household level building data merged with household characteristics. So they've got fantastic data um, and they're going to be able to look really carefully um, at um, consumption of both the treatment and the control groups. Um, they find economically and statistically significant um, effects on both natural gas consumption and electricity consumption. And they also argue convincingly that the data are consistent with with um, efficiency improvements in heating and cooling versus efficiency improvements in loads that don't vary with um, season or temperature like um, um, refrigerators or clothes washers. Okay, so my first comment, um, and I should preface this by saying I am new to the world of building code, so I needed more help in this paper understanding what the, cha the policy change you're studying, what exactly that implied for energy consumption, or what we should expect to see in your data. So fortunately, the paper refers um, a naive reader like myself to this energy gauge website where there was an engineering study done. And they find, um, or the engineering study predicts, um, and I, we're looking at the northern region, Significant increases in, in cooling efficiency, but actually because of this leak-free um, leak to leaky change, if I understand this table correctly, it's predicting um, that we should see um, a loss in efficiency um, in heating. Um, and I, I may be misinterpreting that table. So when I looked at your results, I was surprised to see um, that natural gas efficiency, natural gas consumption falling in um, colder months, suggesting that natural gas efficiency had improved, because I thought, we would actually not see that. So I thought with the paper, if I'm understanding the engineering predictions correctly, I think the paper needs to help me understand why that was happening. First of all, should I be surprised at that outcome? And second of all, if I should be surprised, what are some of the reasons that could explain that? And you actually do this, and I think at the end of the paper, you say, well, what could be happening is, um, how's the switching from natural gas heating to electric heating? And you can use the data to sort of look into that more carefully. But it does seem like the paper um, should do a little bit more in trying to expl explain these results, if I'm correct, in interpreting these results as slightly incons inconsistent with what we'd expect to see, given the nature of the policy change you're studying. OK. The second thing that I found surprising, as do you um, in the paper, is um, that your, your predicted savings exceed um, the engineering predictions, which is not what I would have expected. And so you do a bunch of things to sort of understand why that might be the case. And as, as you showed us, you estimate um, year-built fixed effects and look for a downward trend in the data. And we can't statistically significantly distinguish one year effect from another, so we might think um, that there is no downward trend that we're not picking up with our empirical strategy. I think the really nice thing, I, my first comment is, I think you can go further um, and test this a little more rigorously, given your empirical framework. So you've got this great setting where you're looking at Gainesville, Florida, one, t one city, one load-serving entity. So you can look, at really, look really carefully at other things that you might be leaving out. So for instance, Gainesville was getting greener in a whole lot of ways over the time period you're looking at. So they, were, um, they introduced a green building ordinance, which basically said if you're a builder, in the same year that the um, Florida change was introduced, that said we're going to put up a bunch of incentives for builders who want to exceed the state energy standard. We're going to give you a gold star. We're going to reduce your permitting costs. We're going to um, fast track your permitting applications. So one thing you could do would be to drop those houses that participated in this program and rerun your estimation just to see if your results are affected. This is a very, this, this is a conservative assumption because it's saying that the participation in this ordinance was not affected by the code change, but I think it's worth doing. Similarly, there was a steady increase in the number of Energy Star houses being built in Gainesville, Florida over the time period you're looking at. 
can you just drop those from your sample and just see if the results change? I suspect they probably won't, but this is a slightly more rigorous test of the assumption that there aren't other programs or other incentives that are in place that are um, driving the decrease in both electricity and natural gas consumption in these households um, that you're, you're not controlling for adequately. So I think my basic comment on this paper is, Great paper, great data, great question. Um, a little more help for those of us who aren't as familiar with building code changes and standards to understand what the policy change you're looking at implies for energy consumption. And secondly, um, a little more um, careful analysis of what, of careful exploration of other potential factors and programs that could be driving your results. Okay, uh, how am I doing on time? Great, okay. On to Max's paper. Um, Max also another great <laughs> presenter and did a great job explaining um, what they did in this paper, so I'm not going to retrace his steps. Uh, my first question for these authors is, why not look at natural gas consumption as well? And you probably have a good reason for doing that, but my understanding is the same source of data that you use for electricity also makes available natural gas. And it's also my understanding that, especially in uh, Northeast and Midwest, engineering estimates of impacts on energy use of building codes are actually larger for natural gas and electricity. It'd just be nice to look at that. Okay, my second um, question or comment has to do with how you represent your um, policy change of interest. You make a great argument in the paper that a simple binary zero-one indicator isn't really what you want. So you use this share variable that um, basically looks at the share, uh, you use these great permitting data um, to sort of pick up, to account for the fact that building codes don't instantly take effect. The, the effect is only going to be observed to the extent that you're building new buildings. Um, but I guess one of the things I was, I found this a little hard to interpret because you're sort of combining two effects, the effect of building turnover and the effect of a building code. And I'm wondering if you can also put in there as a control variable vintage housing vintage or something to account for so that way you you're making more of an apples to apples comparison because right now you're not weighting more heavily in your comparison those states with similar building trends or similar um, housing turnover rates um, and yeah I think that that would help us or help me um, sort of tease apart these two effects um, on energy consumption uh, addressing the endogeneity concerns, you're very honest in the paper, you're very clear that this is a concern that you have and you do the best job um, that you can controlling for this. You've got fixed effects in there, you've got these instruments in there. It's, I have a very easy job as a discussant, I can poke a hole in your instrument, um, but I'm not going to have a, a better idea, but I do think that there are some concerns. Lagged uh, temperature variables is going to induce a policy response, it might also induce a private sector response. When I get my high bill at the end of a, a hot summer, I, I call my HVAC guy and he comes in and installs something for next summer. So there's just concerns that your instrument isn't doing exactly what you want it to do, um, which suggests that, and this is going to sound a lot like my suggestion for Matt's paper, um, you might want to think about other things that you're not controlling for um, in your estimation. So I think you uh, control for appliance standards. I'm wondering why um, you don't control, make some attempt to control for demand side management um, activities. This is my final slide. The paper actually helped me to figure, I had never seen the ACEEE energy rank, state energy ranking, but basically what they do is they um, rank states on their energy efficiency policies and their weighting scheme um, sort of indicates the effectiveness of these different policy categories. Demand side management um, came in well ahead of building energy codes and state appliance standards, so it just suggests that to the extent that it's possible, can you control for um, some of these demand side management programs um, in your analysis. So in conclusion, two excellent papers um, doing a really nice job of econometrically uh, estimating the impacts of these important policy interventions. Um, and I look forward to the, um, the final versions of both papers. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Meredith, now we'll hear from our next uh, discussant, um, Randall Walsh from University of Pittsburgh. So um, thanks for having me here. Like Meredith, I have a big caveat in terms of this is something very far afield from what I normally do. Um, and I also need to apologize to uh, Max's co-author for not having his name here, but we've already established that that was Max's fault. Um, so. Uh, so because uh, I'm 
sort of pretty distant from this work, I'm going to take a sort of big picture uh, and very carbon-centric focus on, on discussing this. Um, so from a carbon perspective, I mean, the, the findings are pretty consistent. Uh, what I'm going to call the A and A paper, which should be the A, A, and S paper, um, finds that on average, if you know, if you get the conversion factors right, I don't know if I did that right or not, but I think I got close, you're getting about 720 pounds annual reduction in CO2 in the average house uh, in the United States uh, from these building codes. Uh, the J and K paper, uh, looking specifically at Gainesville, finds a 1,080-pound annual reduction in CO2 emissions, uh, the combination of the electricity and the natural gas. Give you some perspective, we spent uh, 2,300 pounds of CO2 emissions to get me here today. Uh, and um, as of this morning, if you wanted to buy a ton of CO2 emissions on the uh, European exchange and then not, not use them, and so, so reduce that way, it would cost you about $20. Um, so what am I going to do with my time? 10% um, is going to be levity, but you know I, I would normally aim higher, but Matt is on the program and I cannot compete. 10% uh, effusive praise. It's great to get these two papers. I mean, I think they're wonderful papers. I would I hope to see them come across my desk as a co-editor at Economic Inquiry at some point in the near future. Uh, and to have them side by side in a conference like this is just really awesome. Uh, I, I, I genuinely mean that. So we'll get some big picture stuff. I'll snipe at the edges a little bit. And then um, this last 5% is just, like say, covering my own shortcomings. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to focus on carbon. There are some other reasons we might, uh, you know, might care about energy consumption that are valid as well. But uh, the first question that I asked, I, I wasn't one of the people that said talk about taxes this morning, but I did ask, you know, why not just price the externality? And yesterday we had a really nice discussion uh, of some of the reasons why um, the market might not work in this case. Um, but I, I find myself wondering, can these two studies shed some light on the issue? So first, looking at the J and K study in Gainesville, the private return time is, you know, seven and a half years is your sort of, as they said, your rosy, hopeful, you know, uh, actually completely unbelievable uh, estimate. I think they would say the 35 years they threw up is probably more realistic. And um, so it raises, for me, two questions. Maybe Gainesville isn't the right laboratory to think about whether the market can work here. Or, or maybe the McKenzie, and I think I've got the name wrong, curve stuff we saw yesterday, maybe that's for some reason not getting it right. So uh, I, I found that interesting. I, I'm not sure how much more J&K can do on that front. The other paper with the statewide data, um, I think, does have the, the opportunity to shine some light on this issue. And I'm going to come back to it on whether or not economic incentives will, uh, will work. So this is my uh, view of what we do with an engineering study versus a program evaluation study. And um, do we have the latest one? So we spent a bunch of time today talking about the different ways that you know, human beings can really screw up the engineering specifications, whether it be through uh, adaptations. I struggle a bit on the energy to come with an example, but if you think about, for instance, low flow toilets, are we flushing the toilet twice, right? Undoing uh, the engineering that way. Could be economic adaptation. This is, you know, energy is uh, spending less money on energy and the effective price of services has gone down, so maybe I'm going to adapt or rebound that way. Uh, the climate where, where this occurs is going to happen as well. On the other side, though, in terms of the program evaluation, when we ask ourselves what's the effect of the policy going to be, we also need to worry a lot about, well, what's the performance of these houses beforehand, right? Uh, and in particular, if people are responding uh, to uh, their economic incentives, energy prices and climate should, should drive how much, uh, uh, how much investment has already happened, as should you know, these red and blue states, as we've already seen. Historical factors where the housing stock came from is, is probably going to, to have an effect as well. At the end of the day, our program evaluation approach is going to identify the, the sort of the net difference of all of this. And uh, the engineering uh, approaches are going to look right there. And so the engineering studies, as we've already said, they do a great job of identifying one particular mechanism that's a key part of the process, but it miss all the human side. The program evaluation approach that, that both these papers do just such a nice job with is going to be silent on the mechanism. At the end of the day, we don't know how these different set of uh, factors that, that were on that previous slide are going to um, give us an answer, but we're going to have an answer that accounts for all of those. And that's, that's what's really nice. And that's why, uh, you know, as Matt, I think, said quite effectively, it's really sort of stunning that these are pretty novel studies, right? Why aren't there more of, of this type of study out there? Especially, you know, unlike so many of the program evaluation type things we'd like to do, the data is out there, and, and you can actually do a good job, as they've demonstrated on this. 
the, the big, one of the big, oops, one of the big sort of surprising things, and I think big takeaway uh, message here, though, is that I would argue that both these papers suggest that in this context, the engineering studies are giving us pretty good answers, right? Uh, and we might want to ask ourselves, why? Why do we get back these engineering estimates? And I, and I actually think there are some, some uh, reasons to, to believe we might get them back here. The first is that um, outside of the issue of code enforcement, there's not a lot of way, I think, physically, where people are going to get in the way of the engineer's predictions on this front, right? If we're talking about a low E window, or we're talking about a more fuel efficient furnace, it, it's hard to see what sort of physical adaptations people are going to make in the face of this that are going to, that could cause problems in, in some cases, but, but may not here. Also, in terms of rebound in price or income effects, um, I, my sense is, and I don't do this work, my sense is, and, and you, I feel like I keep hearing this, is that people are, are sort of disconnected between their consumption decisions on energy and the price signals they get when they say the, pay, pay the bill, right? So there, so there may be reasons to think that there's some information not getting through that could, could um, depress any price or income effects. And then finally, the other thing you need to have for this to work is there has to be very little pre-code investment, right? Because if everybody had already invested in these sort of uh, systems, and then you come and put in the building code in, yeah, your engineering says if I go from zero to 100, I'm going to get 100. But I've already, at 80, I'm not going to see it. And so um, it's this last point that I'm, I'm really fascinated by, right? This, the, the little pre-code investment. And uh, um, I, I, I find myself asking what these folks can do. And on, the, on this front, on the um, A&A paper, it seems to me that you have the data to try to get at this. And, and in particular, um, if you believe that people are responding to energy prices in terms of their uh, efficiency decisions, and if the energy prices are high enough where there's some return, right, if, if that McKenzie curve stuff actually exists, it ought to be the case that the impact of these policies should be smaller in terms of kilowatt hour consumptions in places with higher energy costs. The reason being you had a, a much stronger incentive in these places to invest prior to the building codes coming in. And so I think in your data you could actually do that comparison and see if you get that, that effect. Um, another thought, sort of just uh, specific thoughts on uh, Max and his co-author's paper is I'd be interested to see how the policy impacts uh, vary in terms of slope, not just level with, with climate, right? So you, can you interact that? and, and, and um, so how, what's the, what's the difference in the policy effect in, in different uh, climate areas? And I'd love to see more uh, insight on, uh, into California. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's an area that we talk about a lot. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the J&K paper, um, the, the first thing I'd say is that we're in a program evaluation mode here. And I think that their data in particular is really lends itself to some, some matching uh, estimators, which would allow us to, to have a little more flexibility in terms of uh, looking at the impact of the treatment in different size houses. And, and so I think there's some reasons to think about doing that. I don't think it would have any effect on, on their results. I, I find the results very convincing. But, but I think we might be able to tease more information out of the data that way. The other uh, comment I would make is that rather than showing me uh, the, the month by month effects of this program, show me the, the climate effects. In other words, I, I, I want to compare two Junes that have the same number of heating degree days as opposed to, or maybe a June and a May that both had the same heating degree days, right? Because I think that's going to get more at the effect. Um, there's a little nuanced thing, I think, there about interpreting the heating results vis-a-vis -vis electricity and natural gas. For cooling, everybody's using electricity. For, um, for heating, as I understand about interpret your results, I'm, not, I'm getting the average across two fuel uses uh, of the effect. And so if I wanted to know what the average effect would be on a house that's using electricity to heat, I would need to adjust those numbers a bit based on the composition of, of heat in your, um, in, your, uh, in, in your sample. And last, I, I'm wondering if your data, you can look to see if you see any evidence of spillovers. Do the um, houses that are built pre-code change their behavior after uh, the implementation of these new building codes. And I think you ought to be able to use your data to, to look and compare the, the behavior. In one way, you want to show me there's no difference, right? Because you, you know, that's, that's a confounding factor. On the other hand, um, it might be worth looking in, and not viewing this as a negative you want to throw away, but actually looking using your data to see if there's a spillover effect. Bottom line, I thought these were two great papers. It was really, uh, really cool to have them side by side, too, to have you know, these very different approaches to the same problem. I, I really appreciate the chance to, to read them and discuss them.
Okay, thank you. I'm going to suggest that we bring uh, our speakers up to this uh, table, if, uh, if you don't mind. That way we can uh, uh, begin by seeing if uh, the paper presenters want to respond to the discussants. And Meredith, do you want to come on up as well? And Randall, do you want to come up? So get the whole party here. Okay. I'll just start by saying uh, thank you for the comments. Very, very uh, helpful and things to think about and maybe talk about some more after. Um, the one, just the one thing that I would pick up on that is uh, the table that Meredith put up, that we at one point in an earlier draft in the paper had that in terms of the percentage changes in energy for heating and cooling. But like you, we're a little bit confused about what that actually means because if it's a performance-based code and you don't know exactly what people are doing overall, we're not, it somehow is a constrained estimate to actually say what the change would be specifically for heating and cooling. And that's why we didn't include it. But so if any of the engineers out there could help illuminate that for us too, it would be, it would be helpful. Uh, the only comments I have are, are thank you for, for the comments that we, we got. Uh, why did we do not do natural gas? Uh, why did we not do natural gas? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and that's electricity. Yeah, but we can very easily do natural gas. It's in the same data set. It's hitting another button, so we, we can look at that. Uh, other than that, I thought all the comments were, were valid and very good, and we look forward to uh, your question. No, I, I have one comment. Um, you know, on, on many of these event studies, sometimes it's useful to test the methodology by applying it to a time at which there was no event, mm -hmm. uh, and then you could see if there is actually a change in, in uh, taste, preferences, something going on that, uh, that you might want to uncover. If you see nothing, then it's just a robustness check on, on what you're doing. I, I was worried about that. So what we did is we randomly assigned building codes to different states in different years, ran the model, then again did a random draw, assigned building codes to different states at different years. And if you look at the distribution of those estimated treatment effects, the one we get in the paper is is in the tail. So this is the, the uh, Esther Duflo and, and, and co-authors criticism that what you may be getting here may just be by accident. And, and, and these findings are robust to it, but we didn't talk about it in the paper, which okay. we definitely should. Good, good. All right, questions from our audience. Here we go. Uh, <clears throat> so both very nice papers, and it's interesting that they come to the roughly similar conclusions about orders of magnitude. On Max's paper, I just wanted to reiterate Meredith's point, because it seems like the variable of interest is an interaction between new construction and building codes. So you want to have just the new construction in there, too, just the non-interacted terms. I'd be very curious to see what the effect of, of that is. Mm -hmm. And on Matt's paper, it seems maybe I haven't been to Florida in a while, but it seems like is Gainesville really rich or something? It seems like they're big houses that use a lot of electricity. It might be interesting just to compare the, the new houses built in Gainesville to the new houses built in the rest of Florida, that they're on average 2,000 square feet. I don't, maybe Florida is very different from California, but. It is. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and, and really so humid. Small. Yeah, I, mean, you can, yeah. I mean, I lived in Florida. And the one question, and I, I, I may have missed it, but how did you know if they were heated by electricity or by natural gas? It says in the, um, because it's interesting, the house I lived in was heated by oil. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know whether you, you had factored that in or how you knew which. So the answer to the question is we don't know. Okay. And there's a part in the paper where we discuss this is the area that we need to, that's not one of the observable characteristics of the household that we have. Throughout Florida, we do know that most houses are actually heated with electricity, though many are heated with natural gas. But one of the things that we actually want to do is on our sort of um, docket of things to do on this paper is we do think, despite the fact that we don't have that data, we do have, since we have the monthly data, we could look at the annual profiles for each house. And it seems like you could probably look and determine whether or not a place is heated by natural gas or by heat by looking at changes in its sort of January, February, uh, maybe in December, natural gas consumption compared to the rest of the year. And if there's a big spike in those months, chances are that it's actually heated with natural gas. And then trying to do our analysis within those houses that only have natural gas or 
do not have natural gas to see if it, the same results hold. Because it was interesting, in Clearwater, the, all the houses, and especially before a certain period of time, they were actually heated by oil. And it's something that, as a Californian, we have this bias, we either think natural gas or electricity, but it, it was a whole different uh, environment. And so that's why I found it interesting with the assumption that was made. Yeah, okay. so we don't, we don't know, but we want to try to get to the bottom of that. Okay. Hi, uh, Nick Stolatis. Um, I think the discussants have done a great job in, in doing the analysis. I give you guys kudos on the uh, great presentation. <laughs> I, I'd like to pick up on the household composition. It seems to me in Gainesville you may have a, a larger percentage of, of retirees, uh, household, uh, households that may use less uh, utilities than one with children that are running Game Boys and and hi-fi sets and what have you. Um, and, and also to consider whether there are alternative uses for these utilities. I think um, uh, there was a reference to non-heating and cooling uses. Um, I would think in a place like Gainesville, for example, where you know, you're going to set up your barbecue, maybe the newer houses have their barbecues hooked up to the natural gas line, not a propane tank. Um, so are, are there those alternatives that are uh, potentially affecting the, uh, uh, the, the use of the use utilities. And, and then finally, when you're dealing with residential households, both on new construction and unless you're looking at communities that are developed by a single builder uh, that may have a level of sophistication sufficient to <coughs> fully integrate the technology that these codes are, are looking to uh, establish, um, you know, most houses are built one-offs by a, a, a contractor that may do a half a dozen a year, and their level of sophistication is such that they just don't know what needs to be done. And from a household standpoint, an individual is not looking at the t technology in quite the same terms as a business might, and, and doesn't know enough to ask for alternatives so that the, the uh, boiler that, that is being proposed by a builder, is that truly the best technology that's available? Forget about pricing. Pricing could be equivalent. It's just, hey, that's the, the model. I get it from the same dealer. I've been getting my technology for the last 20 years. That's what I'm going to install. It's compliant. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm told it is. So the level of sophistication may have an effect on what exactly is installed within the, the residences. And I think that could be a, a, an impactful feature that, that maybe it hasn't been addressed. I guess just a brief comment. Grant, I think we need to get some airplane tickets to go to Gainesville <laughs> and tour around and see what's going on with some of these uh, households. So we don't, we don't know exactly, but in terms of what, one just comment, sort of just generically in terms of the methodology, is that this is why maybe um, we are actually particularly fond of the weather results that we have where we could use these fixed effects. Because in that case, if it was the if it's the, the case that newer builders say installed grills that were more natural gas, then we actually control for that average, the average difference of the of the household, and then seeing how they respond to the weather differently. Um, that's the real distinction between our the two types of analyses that we did, and we find it reassuring that we're seeing the same pattern across the two. So in a sense, that just builds support for the prior estimates that that we that give us more confidence in our average estimate differences that we have. Hi, thank you for your presentations, uh, Max. In one of your slides, you mentioned you asked the question: if if it's free money, if it's two hundred and fifty dollar bills, why aren't consumers picking it up, and then we jumped into this very interesting topic of, of building codes, but I'm still, uh, I'm, I'm not understanding why consumers, myself included, why we are not picking up these $250 bills out there. So there, there's this old literature on the energy efficiency gap, which is actually an old literature that continues growing, but we, we keep on telling the, the same stories, I think, in, in some sense, with little empirical evidence supporting uh, 
any of them. So there's, you know, if it's really expensive for you to uh, shut down your, your, your factory and install the equipment that you need in order to save the energy, if you need to shut down the factory for five days and you lose output for five days, that may swamp the overall gains from improved energy efficiency. And if I, as the researcher, don't count that five-day shutdown, I'm getting, you know, negative savings when instead of, uh, sorry, negative costs instead of what actually seems like not a good idea to do. Uh, there may be these stories where uh, consumers just don't have the information. I think that's the favorite one told in favor of building codes. We just don't know how good building codes are for you, so we will tell you, you know, what to what to do. Uh, there's a, a variety of other issues. The principal agent uh, thing that that Catherine mentioned. Uh, if, if I were to, to, to venture in another literature with the right data, which really don't exist in the right training in experimental economics, I think this would be a fruitful literature to go into and maybe uh, approach it from a more behavioral economic point of view. Why do people not pick this stuff up? Uh, because in a neoclassical sense, I'm as baffled as you are. Could I interject? Um, I mean, it seems to me that, that a takeaway here is that the uh, you're showing that the engineering estimates are roughly consistent with what you're finding from the building, from the actual implementation of the building codes, but then you're also showing that uh, a lot of this stuff does not have a particularly good payback. Uh, and so where's the gap <laughs> in that mm -hmm. sense? Is there still a gap? I'm all into $250 bills laying on the sidewalk, but a seven and a half to 35 year payback period is not, is not actually um, consistent. Not much of a gap. It's not consistent with that. On that seven and a half years, I mean, seven and a half years is sort of heroically optimistic. I mean, as, as Matt says clearly in the paper, right? I mean, it's just seven and a half years is, is 35 years is closer. If you believe the numbers in the paper, 35 years is probably closer. Mm -hmm. But also, and, and Carl can correct me if I'm wrong on this, I think your calculation, while I think the Windows calculation is a, is a, is a, is a good one to do here, uh, having just installed new windows in our house, we're never going to make that money back. Uh, not in 50 years in, in, in living in that house, I, I think, if you once count the installation costs and, and everything. So the, the point here is that when you look at these, these building codes, uh, the costs that people usually cite, they're not the, the differences in, in, in just glazing. I think a lot of that is also much cheaper options in the buildings, uh, different insulation materials, the building envelope. Uh, Proper insulation of ducts is a good example. Yeah. It's supposedly Which, not very expensive. And you certainly wouldn't be looking at 4%. You wouldn't invest in double glazing for 4% savings. That, that wouldn't be a lot. Can I just make a quick, and someone in this room, I was interested in your payback, and I went to look at the estimated payback for the refrigerator appliance standard improvements, and that was seven years. So I think seven years is in the ballpark of some of these energy efficiency okay. policy interventions. Mm -hmm. But someone here can correct okay. me. Seven, you're waiting patiently. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to note that it's a little baffling when people write papers that uncover new information and then are baffled that people don't already know this in their behavior. <laughs> so I'm less baffled by it because two bafflements of that sort cancel out. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I was a little, no, I wouldn't say baffled, but um, I, I puzzled by something in uh, Matt and Grant's paper that you have a graph on natural gas savings that is negative, that goes negative at the front and back end of the year in the winter months, but is positive, not quite statistically significant, but jointly pretty clearly statistically significant in the middle. Um, and, you know, I'm not trying to just pick at something, but is that telling us that there is something else going on that perhaps if you adjusted for would shift the whole curve down? And that is that what that these new houses are natural gas intensive in some non-weather way that you're not picking up. For instance, I'm, I'm not sure barbecues use that much, but they have big stoves or they have gas dryers um, or other cool. things that would tend to shift the whole curve up and therefore underestimate the effect of the, uh, of the, um, of the codes. 
maybe you know we, we uh, it, if you right. you know uh, <laughs> we, 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 don't, we don't know and we're open to these suggestions and certainly we'll do everything we can or to try to track down and see yeah right. yeah or the opposite could be true I mean that could be have less gas as well well n no what's going electric. on is in the uh, in the summer months these guys the post houses are using more gas than the pre-houses when you would think neither of them is using how gas for things that have to do with insulation. So it looks like yeah. it's more intensive. It could be way. like, you know, more just gas stove. Maybe they have a gas yeah. stove yeah. in the house. No, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Right. Water eating dryers. Next. Hi. I also am impressed with the papers. I was taken in by the nuance that was discovered and how delicately things were examined and how um, creatively things are examined, but I would like to challenge you, is it possible since 4% maybe or 2% and 35 year payback isn't gonna get us anywhere, is it possible to pick out some of the houses that uh, are hyper performers, uh, high performance uh, houses that are approaching 70 and 80% energy reduction and find out um, how they did it and what their payback is because that's where we have to go uh, pretty damn quickly if we're going to save things, if you believe in global warming. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's compatible with um, Randy's approach of matching. If we could look at houses that were well matched together um, based on observable characteristics and see a big gap, then um, when Grant is down there, he can go knock on the door <laughs> and go and see what they've, you know, installed. I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure while, um, it seems that our data is, is useful for answering some of the questions, getting into a particular case. I'm not sure we can actually do that, at least from our um, offices. We may the have to go down there. Is small. Yeah, and go and go and uh, and look at some of these some of these places and I mean it's a good point. It's a good point. Uh, I'm not sure that our data enables us to pick out those specifically high performing places though. Yes. I have just one question uh, for the math paper. Uh, I like your paper a lot. And one concern is, uh, in general, um, the residential customers increase their electricity consumption over time after they moved in, in their new house. So um, I think you have done uh, a rather robustness check already. But one thing you can do is just use your control group and make like a fake control and treatment within your control group and look at their um, differences in their consumption um, and if you find like a zero effect between them or very small effect then you can reject this concern so that's my uh, suggestion so we do actually drop the first 12 months of new construction for partial occupancy so so we because um, it, it turns out that the first year is very erratic when people are moving into the house so we drop that and I guess you know it came up it came up before too in terms of those graphs that we looked at the average differences in consumption by effective year built, in a sense that is kind of like these counterfactuals. Instead of looking at before and after the, the years after the code change, just look at the years before and there was no difference within the years before and there was no difference within the years after. The difference was split between the two. That's kind of like doing the, the sort of policy experiment where there was no policy. That's kind of how we interpret those graphs. Well, we could actually probably make that more explicit. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the discussants for you know, really superb discussion. And um, Matt, uh, well, first of all, I want to make a general comment, and, and I have a question and a suggestion for you, Matt, about the, the, the confirmatory or not nature of this with respect to the engineering estimates. To connect to what we were talking about yesterday morning, it's very important to understand. In, in, the, in the graph that I showed yesterday about the dispersion, you know, the, the gap in actual prediction, in that particular sample and in other samples like that, often, not always, on average, whatever it is, is a good thing. It does save energy relative to whatever the baseline is. The point is the dispersion, okay? And the, because the, again, the, the, the claim about building codes and all these policies is not that on average, the buildings will come out better and the private gains will be realized, but that everybody will realize a private gain, okay? There's no discussion in this literature almost about, you know, with respect to the engineering uncertainty or anything, about the fact that there's gonna be winners and losers from the policies. So. I'm wondering if you have, I mean, I'd be very interested in seeing what the distribution over the entire sample of, ener of combined energy you know, in terms of BTUs or electricity and gas separately, what the savings look like. 
Uh, and the other question I have is, what is the, re uh, uh, the same question also about, you know, what is the mean payback privately? Um, and uh, I'm wondering, I wasn't clear on the relationship between the payback estimates and, if any, and the savings. Um, were those, were those, were the, were those, the payback range a function of the, of the, of uh, It was the, the average, the, based on the, the estimated savings that we did. Okay. So both just in terms of both in terms of how much the residences would save on their utility bills, mm -hmm. and then in terms of the um, the externalities associated with the pollution emissions from the electricity that mm -hmm. wouldn't have to be have been generated. Just out of curiosity, what was the mean payback private? Do you know offhand? So the the the, the S, when we say the seven point five to thirty five, that is the range of the mean. That's not the, the ends of the distribution. So we're only calculating it for the mean under different scenarios of whether or not you have high sa whether or not you get the savings during on peak times of electricity or off peak I times. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I thought I agreed with Meredith's comments about how important it is to look at the range of things, other things that might be influencing in addition to appliances. I just wanted to mention um, a Sacramento Municipal Utility District study that was uh, done, I, I think it was mostly a measurement and evaluation study done on uh, what were <coughs> Is it new zero energy home, new construction fairly recently? And they found that as the um, building usage itself gets smaller and smaller, the plug load can swing it higher and higher. And so it was actually the cultural behavior of the residents. Uh, they were, it was a beer drinking, TV watching population <laughs> that moved into zero energy homes. And they were surprised to see how much more they were using than predicted by the engineering analysis. <laughs> Turns out people were plugging um, old refrigerators into the garage, which had very high plug load, and lots of TV in the home, and they were filling it with beer and watching TV. <laughs> and so, so the cultural <laughs> behavior plus the plug load was significantly moving the zero energy home predicted engineering results. So I just, it's sort of a reinforcement to, to continue to look at the specifics of where the house is relative to all these other factors. Should have beer consumption at the right hand. There. <laughs> <laughs> Another research job. Uh, John, uh, just two quick observations. First, there's a million reasons why in the AAS paper that code variable ought to be measured with a lot of error and ought not to be significant. And I'm really amazed that you can't make four or five percent go away. And in that sense, it really changes my prior on the importance of building codes and reducing energy. And it's surprising because these codes are not adopted wholesale. There's exceptions. Every state has a slightly different regulation. And you're measuring it by a, a year. And I think that's it's amazing. Um, I do think that you guys really ought to spend a lot of time in Gainesville, though. I mean, it seems that one of the things that, that you could do kind of quickly and cheaply is, you know, you've got this one housing market. It's very easy to find out information about the characteristics of the specific houses, the selling prices of these houses. People live in their houses for seven years and then sell them, so you're going to have some resales. There's all kinds of ways in which you could try and get at the asset value of this and to look at compare assets with flows, and there are all sorts of things that if you could find some guys to go spend a summer at 99% humidity in Gainesville, <laughs> would be interesting to do. So I, I think one of the questions we, we have to ask is why would Max put in double glazing? Um, now, it might be and that Max... told me to. <laughs> <laughs> it might... Well, he might, have been, he might have been listening to me, or uh, he might have said, that, well, it's cheaper than PV, but it's certainly it. not the cheapest way in, in a new construction to reduce your uh, energy consumption, but there are other reasons why people do double glazing. Uh, one of them has to do with noise control that's much quieter. And another has to do with uh, uh, radiant uh, temperatures of the walls. And so the, the comfort, there's, a, there's a consequential comfort factor so that it may well be that that was the method that people chose to meet the comply in Gainesville. But uh, you ha really have a problem in trying to untangle the, the costs and benefits of, uh, of, of low E windows uh, uh, as a compliance strategy. I think it's... Uh, an oversimplification to, 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 to attribute it all to, uh, uh, to energy saving. Or, and that, that would not be the only purpose for, for solving the problem with, uh, with double glazing. 
but the code writers, right, the people who write the who write the policy, they don't take into account that my kid doesn't squeeze their fingers in the in the new windows because they don't fall down and they don't worry about my added comfort by. Well, the code writers in in the case of Gainesville, as I understand, it's a performance code, not a you got to put double mm -hmm. glazing in. Uh, so you get to choose how you're going to meet right. the you're going to choose how you meet the performance criteria. Now, m many codes have both a performance path and, and California certainly has a performance path and a prescriptive path. So you can mm -hmm. just do it on a checklist or you can go to somebody who will run a little computer model for your house. Um, it, th there are some complexities here. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, we have time for two questions if they're quick. So uh, I think you were next. Hi, I'm uh, Barry Hooper from the city of San Francisco. And what would be really interesting to me would be the replication of the micro level study in other communities trying to get it a, a ratio, a typical ratio of the engineering estimate versus the, um, the econometric estimate because that, that just that the 5% the happens to line up in the two studies is, is interesting, but if you look at the code cycle in California, <coughs> the typical incremental increase is in that, in the last couple cycles has been in the 10 to 15% range is what the, the on the engineering side they've been aiming for in terms of energy efficiency improvement and then there are also what might be a fun uh, set of studies would be looking at some of the communities in California that have adopted incremental uh, uh, savings budgets over that and those are typically also in the range of 15 percent so A does that ratio start to break down or have some other effects is it that you get tighter or a bigger change but also it, is there uh, any consistency in ratio? And it seems like the, the micro approach in a lot of communities might be a way to, to get at that type of question. Thanks. Okay, one last question. Uh, Joe Wang here, uh, Berkeley. Uh, just, just a quick uh, you know, naive uh, suggestion, maybe a little bit beyond what we're discussing here, uh, about picking up the, the $250 upon the floor. I think uh, I hesitate to pick it up because I may have to spend $2,500 to put out window or, or whatever insulation. So just a naive suggestion, maybe we should uh, look into let government pick up that $250. And uh, in exchange with the residents pay some kind of fixed fee, whatever you pay monthly now, you just keep on paying for a number of years. And if 35 years or seven years, whatever you guys' analysis shows, okay? And uh, make a registration, maybe even the federal level, using the Berkeley, California uh, example, modify it, and so on and so on and so forth. Uh, happened to be today, Obama is talking about uh, meeting a whole bunch of people, 69 or some, some number of experts, community leaders for jobs. And I think the green building is a way to create jobs. So uh, I, I like to use this opportunity using this particular session to just uh, you know, mention this kind of a little bit crazy, naive ideas, and I'd be glad to get the input in the next, uh, the rest of the day, and uh, see. Uh, happened to be this morning, I managed to twist the arm of uh, one of the represent one of the staff member of uh, Representative Barbara Lee, was here for two hours, <coughs> and uh, she's picking up some of those ideas, and I'd uh, like to get input from that. I'm very naive, I'm not. Anybody wanna take that up? So I, I, a famous blogger in the room said, if that $250 bill is actually lying on the ground, then McKinsey should go in the business of picking up your, uh, your electricity bill and then uh, invest in the, in the right technologies and, and, and get the difference, right? Uh, why is nobody doing this? There's apparently one startup in New York City that, that is attempting to, to do this maybe. But, you know, that we'll find out how well that startup does and I think that'll tell us a lot about whether these $250 bills are actually on the ground. Okay. One, one quick comment too. Yes. So I remember when I was in grad school, we always talked about dollar bills lying on the sidewalk. <laughs> there seems to be an inflationary effect going on, <laughs> which also reminds me of when I was thinking about dollar bills or on lying on the sidewalk when I was in grad school. I was thinking about getting a job, which makes me also just want to put a plug for Grant, who is actually on the job market right now. So I encourage you to, if you want to talk further about this paper, you're welcome to talk to me d during the breaks, but also you could talk to Grant, who is um, looking for a job and is just as knowledgeable as me on this project. Thank you for your comments. Okay, so I want to thank our speakers and discussants for their lively presentations and the questioners for lively questions.
fact that um,